I have the mic, I'm going to do whatever that I want to do. <laughs> to recognize my wife, hallelujah. And to appreciate her, hallelujah. Yeah, I'm Things that happen to me on Facebook. Amen. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His name. Amen. I want to recognize Apostle Francis and his sons and daughters. Praise the Lord. Can we give them, give them a big round of applause? We are sure all the way from Eastern King. Um, no, he's, he's, he's London. He's here. We are together with the family. Can they stand? Oh, Mr. Godwin, hallelujah. Amen. It's an honor, hallelujah. And the rest of the family faces, hallelujah. Amen. 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 Yeah, I greet you in a special way. You are all the seated of the Elias. You are the chosen frozen. Amen. And also special recognition as well. Uh, Mother who raised me. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, we used to preach the gospel in Constance. Amen. Amen. Uh, oh, my mother, Manana. Praise, praise the name of this. Please stand up, Mama, so that they know that even though my mother is no more, but I still have mothers. Wow. Hallelujah. Wow. Special grace and recognition. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, well, in my heart, I wanted to speak to you on matters around excellence um, and also issues around wisdom. So, can we open our Bibles in Isaiah chapter 11? Where's Edward? I think I saw Edward as well. The preacher of no Hallelujah. Amen. 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 The fire. Aha. Amen. What was he talking about? Something. Very heavy. Amen. We appreciate you for this. Just one. Uh, reach for us. Uh, Say this way, the spirit of the Lord. The of the Lord. Don't be lazy, man. This, this, this being a classic bit. Yeah. Oh, I really want to engage and impart the spirit of wisdom. Amen. Amen. The spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord. The spirit of uh, wisdom. The spirit of wisdom. That is all in verse two. The spirit of understanding. The spirit of understanding. The spirit of counsel. The spirit of counsel. The spirit of might. The spirit of might. The spirit of knowledge. The spirit of knowledge. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. So these are the seven spirits of God. Amen. Just to make a note, you cannot move in wisdom and be against someone who moves in the spirit of power, because there's, there's the same source. Amen. So when one believer is graced by God to move in a measure of the spirit of wisdom, it is important then that you do not criticize them for just moving in wisdom and not moving in power. Our emphasis will always differ. This generalized definition of an apostle that is collective and corporate that makes him to do everything based on the fact that we read from the pattern of the book of Acts and from that pattern, that pattern is supposed to provide us a template not necessarily at times to release a 
standard order of what every apostle should do is problematic in our definition because it puts undue pressure on things that people are not called for. And as a result of that, you know what it does? It makes someone who has the passion to see miracles happen in the church to want to operate in balance and that balance becomes an imbalance because they do not have the grace in that area that much. And then the person operates under pressure and as a result of that we end up with somebody who is trying to be doctrinally accurate without the grace of God and then they start preaching things out of that pressure only to find out they did not have the grace. If we left them to do what they were passionate about, they would be excelling in that thing. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we make mistakes because we have read the word. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm just laying a foundation to your feet. Sometimes we make a mistake of reading the verse and studying the lifestyle of a particular ministry in the Bible. And then we want to use it as a standard for everything. And then we make mistakes. For instance, there are things like, I don't believe an evangelist should lead a church. There is no verse like that. But the evangelist is in the church. I don't believe that a pastor can evangelize. There's no verse like that. But the truth is, that there is a pastor in the church. Sometimes in our way of fixing extremes, we cancel the truth by providing another extreme in our passion to correct the practice or what we see that people are doing in this generation that is out of line with what is recorded in the scriptures. And by being so stereotyped in our definition, and by, by definition, I mean exactly definitions, not function really. We end up causing people who have grace in other areas, though it is not a major grace, to remain doing the same thing without learning anything or growing in anything because somehow our teachings and our preaching decided you must know your limits. And we say good words and it makes sense. Stay in your lane. I'm good with that. It's spoken within the right context. Stay in your grace. But I have a problem with those statements being spoken. Meanwhile, they place the limit to the grace you have not seen in your life. I have a problem with that. I want us to open ourselves up to the Lord to a degree that whatever he wants to do, he is not limited by the office, he is not limited by the definitions, he is not limited by how people have concluded this should be this way. Because it is possible that God can come and use methods and means in our generation that are not out of bounds with scripture but that are just methods that are not common to our practice and we should be careful of removing such things prematurely because they are not part of the traditional practice we have in the house or in our lives what am I saying and why, why am I saying all of this I'm saying this to say be open minded because failure to be open minded you are close to becoming a son of a Pharisee. To be a Pharisee, sometimes we view it as a doctor of what one what is the Saint Henry, teacher of the law, keeper of the law, observer of the law, and all of those things. Whereas in our attitude already, we have become Pharisees and we are now opposing whatever it is that God can do which does not fit our context. That we easily kick it out and demonize it, even before we understand it. To a point, I think we have explained miracles 
to a degree that there is no miracle unless it is explained. Yeah. Even the God that is supposed to perform a miracle, he must explain that miracle to you. And then, after explaining the miracle to you, then and only then you will say, okay, this is the miracle that is supposed to happen in this assembly. And by so doing, God cannot move spontaneously mm -hmm. as he wills. The wind blows where it listed. After we have done our schools, after we have done our contacts, after we have read all the verses, we must allow the spirit to hover in the church and to do as he please. Don't worry about him explaining himself. He will raise people. After he has moved in an unusual way, that will begin to, be, to have scriptures that teach that surely he who sits in the heaven can laugh. Religion is when we have figured him out. Somebody say amen. amen. Religion also has to do with if things are not done your way, then they are not God's way. Because somehow you have reached a level where you believe everything you say is right. You are correct and everybody is wrong. That is a dangerous place to be as a child of God. That is why I advocate for humility. Therefore, I want to raise this in this house. Don't be a master of the scriptures. Come on, Rabbi. Be a student so that when you are corrected, you don't have to fall from a chair of being a master and a rabbi. Refusing correction. Continue to be a disciple that learns the, in the word. So that even if you make a mistake, you are able to say, I was still in the learning curve. Hallelujah. And you can still maintain and keep that attitude of a servant. And still minister in the house of the Lord. In peace and according to God's grace. So I greet the students in Jesus' name. Amen. You are still going to make many mistakes in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Some miracles you will not be able to explain because I've come to discover that our God is bigger than our minds. God is bigger than our apostolic things. He's bigger than your camp. He's bigger than the prophetic. Bigger than your title. Bigger than what you have built. Bigger than what you have achieved, he's big. And every time you box him, it's like he becomes uncomfortable. He breaks the box just to say to you, remember, I am the almighty God. It is as if all the time he's going to prove himself that he's big. But sometimes God can do things that are so familiar to us to a point we can think he's called, I am the friend of God. You, you can be elevated even to a level where you feel I'm the friend of God, where becoming a friend of God becomes a, a way of entering into idolatry. Yeah. Where you are just used to him. You know how people treat the Holy Ghost casually, saying Holy Ghost is my friend. So it's cool, man. He's your friend, but you've forgotten one thing. He is God's friend. Yeah. He's a different kind of friend. The, the words paracletos, yeah? the words advocate, he has come to your level, you have not come to his level. So here's the thing, do not misunderstand when the vertical relationship comes down to your level. Don't, don't misunderstand that as equality. None of you in this house are equal to God. If you are, I might as well bow to you. If Peter was equal to God, then he should not have said to Cornelius, stand up, I'm a man like you. He should not have said that. And there's a difference between honor and worship. May God have mercy on us. It's a thin line on how you can easily disrespect the man by not sensing the grace in the man. And how you can exaggerate the grace in the man and then end up in idolatry. So the covenantal language and the covenantal conversation we are supposed to have as believers should draw us back into one thing. And this for me 
is one thing that changes everything. If you can get this, you are the next apostle. I ordain. <laughs> Amen. If you can get that the cross is the hermeneutical field. And if you can accurately use the cross as you obtain the old and the new and use that filter to know what is it that made it and what is it did not make it. Then you are going to become a clear voice in your generation and you are a keynote speaker already according to me. It is in that ability. It is in that wisdom of the spirit to know how to preach from the old, presenting the new, and how to present the new without putting people in bondage concerning the old. And without also preaching dualism. But we are not sure what you are saying. Today you say it's correct to do this, the next day it's not correct to do this. So there are two, there's a dual voice that comes from you. So we, we can't build with duality. We want the singleness of attitude and thought. So that what you build is built out of consistency. Praise the Lord. Because if you preach truth, the good thing about truth is that truth is eternal. It will never change. Hallelujah. It can come to us in bits and pieces, in fragments. But the truth of it is that the progressive revelation of truth does not in any way discredit the absolute truth it presents. It doesn't. So it is our minds. God does it for us. You can't allow a baby to eat meat. Same way God has to take you precept upon precept. Line upon line. Hear a little and there a little. That is why if God deals with us that way, therefore the right place or the right uh, ministry or what you should rightfully call it, is that you are students because bit by bit is breaking tradition, breaking religion, and is causing you to repent even from the things you have heard him say. It's so difficult for you to get rid of what you have heard God say to you, which is now outdated. He said it to you, he said it to you, and he said it, and when he said it, you felt. This is present day truth. It was like, you have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye. Now if you are a Jew and you are now told, now I say unto you, that's problematic. That you need to, you are used to getting revenge immediately. You are used to retaliation. Now you are told, don't retaliate. So, mamakshang empama in fact, that's how the Pama is and the Pama. So it comes this way. So you must allow it to come that way. If you give the left, pa, the right, poo, also. And that is the only way you can have the doctrine of Christ operating in you. Praise the Lord. Now, there are seven spirits of God that we have read just here and may the lord help us to come to the order of the spirit proverbs chapter 9 Let's go there if you don't know proverbs <laughs> let me tell you where is proverbs amen can we say genesis <laughs> exodus exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy <laughs> Joshua, Joshua, Judges, Judges, Ruth, Ruth, Samuel, Samuel, Second Samuel, Second Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Ezra, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. You have reached your destination. Chapter 9. Can you all say wisdom? wisdom. And wisdom has its own banquet. 
wisdom builds a house, and when wisdom builds a house, you are that house that wisdom is building. Wisdom is Christ personified. Then wisdom cuts seven pillars. So today we are cutting the seven pillars of wisdom, and we want to say you need to cut these pillars of wisdom in order for you to become a man and a woman of wisdom in your lineage. The Bible says that wisdom is a principal thing. The Bible says greater than Solomon is already on the inside. He is the embodiment of your temple. He lives on the inside of you. So, in order for us to make a difference in this generation, we need to walk in wisdom. So today, if you are saying to me you are wise, I want to check if you have you cut out the seven pillars. Wisdom targets one thing, foolishness. It's either you are making wise decisions or foolish decisions. So we want to see if you are a man, woman of wisdom, must have cut down seven pillars. And without these pillars, unfortunately, the decisions we have made are not wisdom. And the opposite will be foolishness. I know people don't like to hear that. When wisdom casts out the pillars, as wisdom builds the house, it casts out seven pillars. What are these seven pillars? What are these seven sources of wisdom? Some of these things are elementary, but your decisions and where you find yourself today says a lot about whether you have cut those seven pillars of wisdom. Let's read the verse for the purpose of order. Verse 1. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. Uh -huh. She has killed her beast. She has mickled her wine. I don't want her to kill the beast today. I want her to just cut out the pillars. Can we read verse 1 again? Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. Amen. Wisdom <coughs> has built her house. And she has cut out seven pillars. In order for your life to be built God's way and in God's wisdom, we need to make sure whether you have cut these seven pillars. Now, um, the Bible has this information for all of us. And these pillars today, I want you to view them as the seven fountains of wisdom, where you can draw wisdom. These things must be the seven sources of wisdom. I have looked into these seven pillars and I have seen over the years that uh, I have become the man that I am today not because I know too much but because I have always consulted my seven pillars and they have helped me from foolish decisions. So, I want you to walk that path as well. I want you also to take this as counsel from the Lord concerning any matter in life. I want you to really hold on to this principle and they, they may become the foundation and the pillars before any decision you make. Joshua chapter 1 is it. It is the things you know, but the problem is that it is the things you do not practice. Joshua 1 verse 8. Say to your neighbor, I want to walk in wisdom. I want to walk in wisdom. And guess where it begins? It begins here. Amen? It begins in this verse. Please read Joshua. Mouth. Wait, this book of the what? The Lord. Shall not depart well. Amen. One of the signs that you are not walking in wisdom, we hear it in your speech. Because the book has departed. 
How do you make sure that the book does not depart from your mouth? Let's read. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Alright, can you all say meditate? meditate? Can we say meditate? meditate? We are not talking about Eastern Mosaic levitation. We are not talking about emptying the mind. We are talking about filling the mind with the word. Biblical meditation means to think. Biblical meditation means to ponder. Biblical meditation is to keep the word before your eyes. Is to gaze upon the word. So that it is before you all the time. And if you if 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 the word does not, this book does not depart automatically from the abundance of the heart, the mouth will release the wisdom. But it will never happen without meditation. So Believers must come to an understanding of knowing what is true meditation. So I will give an illustration. You need to take one verse, perhaps. Maybe let's take your favorite verse, even if it's out of context. You know the one that is out of context. I can do all things. You know that one? All things through Christ who gives me strength. I know that that, that verse seems to connect people and their circumstances. It gives them the I can revelation. Are we correct? But without the, in fact, I will make them, I will do the, con I don't want to talk about the context, but, but, but the context is. I don't want to talk the con about the context, but the context is. I don't want to talk about the context, but the context is. That Paul has just received an offering from Epaphroditus. And with this, offer, with this offering, after he has said, not that I needed a gift. You are saying, oh, I'm okay. This church in Philippine has been uh, partnering with the apostle. I think sometimes we need to talk about how to partner with an apostle. Because verse 1 simply means you don't only partner with him by prayer, you partner with him financially. Come on, come on. Look at this revelation. It's moving so fast in this church. It's changing minds. The church at Ephesus partnered with the apostle financially. I don't want to talk about that. But listen, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You need to take that verse. If you are a person who knows that you spend 10 hours in the mirror, put that verse on your mirror. So that while you do the punishing, you make sure you see the verse, I can do all things through Christ. If you are a person who knows that you spend most of your time driving, put that verse. Somewhere in your car. <laughs> I don't know where. Uh, uh, it could be, you would ask the Upu priest, Kauza Spendur. But maybe buy audio Bible. Make sure that you hear the verse over and again. It, meditation does not immediately require understanding. It does not demand that you understand. The thing is, you are putting the word in your mind. The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to drag it inside your heart so that it can come out as faith through your mouth. But the process does not happen overnight. So here's the thing. The reason you have not working in wisdom is because you have not becoming, you have not been meditating on God's word. You have been doing everything. I can tell you what has been before you. The problems you have have been before you. The soul peace that you are has been before you. And the things that you like has been before you, but the word has not been before you. So the simple definition as it, as it connects to meditation is that you keep the word close by. That's meditation. Yeah. By meditation, I make sure that the word of God is close before my eyes. I can see it with my eyes and I can hear it with my ears all the time. And let's read the verse. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is But no, no, I want the part you got to meditate.
from the spirit can cause you to live a life of wisdom. So now how do we connect? The word of God is the wisdom of God. When you read the scriptures, you are reading the wisdom of God. So guess what? It means wisdom is before my eyes. Wisdom is ministered to my ear. So my eye gate and my ear gate is bombarded with the wisdom of God. And guess what that will do? What it will do then, it will make my way prosperous. By prosperous, we are not talking about prosperity. Wait a minute. We are talking about living the quality of life that will make you make the right decisions all the time. It will make your way prosperous. It will attract the favor, yes, of the Lord in your life because you are living the quality of life that is governed by the spirit of wisdom. So this kind of impartation never happens without meditation. So you have been putting other things before your eyes except one thing that must change your life, the world. The reason why you have not been observing to do. And the other reason why you are not meditating on the word. Because the word is not a priority. And if the word is not a priority, the word will never become the practice. And if the word is not the practice, then you will never see the result of the word. You will only remember God when you are in trouble. Meditation. Put the word. So guess what that demands? It demands that you must remove all distractions. It demands that you must cut some other things that are wasting your time. And begin to gaze upon the word, hear the word. And this is a revelation I have never spoken in my life before. And it is the highest revelation you will ever hear in your lifetime. And the revelation is the Holy Spirit will never open the Bible for you. It's a big revelation, Pastor Rob. You should receive it with excitement. The Holy Spirit will never open the Bible for you. The Holy Spirit will never read the Bible for you. Some of you are so lazy. The Holy Spirit has to release a dream. Open Isaiah for you. So it requires diligence. Meditation is a discipline. And guess what you are disciplining? You are disciplining two things. What you say and how you live. This is the first pillar of wisdom, meditation on God's word. We talk about it. We say exciting things about it. All that Joshua was required to do was to keep the word of God before his eyes and make sure that he hears the word. So, by so doing, his life was governed by the voice of God. His life was governed by what God was saying. Let's finish the verse. Observe to do all according to what is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. And shall make thy way what? Prosperous, and you will have what? Good success. I, I can imagine what is Joshua's success because in context we are talking about Joshua here. The success of actually having the ability to lead a generation that comes from the wilderness to the promised land. It is the success to reach the promised land. Now let me ask you. Most people have forgotten the promises of God because you have only received prophecies that speaks about what you have in your pocket, but they have never said anything about what God wants to do for you. In other words, prophetic words that are just my sister over there, you've got five friends in your pocket, yeah, papa, nature, why, and all of those things. They, are, they have nothing to do with the promises of God. They are just arresting your attention to the main thing. So you find that you are excited as an unbeliever with a word of knowledge, but without a word of wisdom, you still don't have a promise. The word of wisdom carries purpose. It carries destiny. So when you receive that from God, this is stuff to hold on to. To say this is a realm. Prophecies are carrying promises. And these promises are realm of words. So that when it becomes difficult in life, you are able to say, I'm going to meditate on this way. This is what God said. It governs your life. So you observe to do everything that is spoken therein. So you then begin to meditate on the words. So keep, keep the word of God before your eyes and before your ears. So it's important to meditate on God's word. That's the first source of wisdom.